and today's video is going to be about blue zones. But first, how I got interested. I actually have some news. I've had my entire genome sequenced, all of it. And you can too, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit, a little bit later. But the thing is, I found out that I actually have the FOXO3 gene associated with longevity in blue zones. Now, there are other genes, but I have this one. Take a look at my results. This variant has been influenced by the CERT1 gene, and it's been shown to contribute to longevity in several studies. Uh, FOXO, or forkhead box transcription, is involved with aging phenotypes such as insulin sensitivity, cardiac disease, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. But before you despair and worry that you've drawn a poor genetic hand, know that our genes play only about 16 to 25 percent of what can contribute to your longevity. And that leaves a robust 75 percent in your hands. So there are going to be three parts to this report. First, I'm going to talk about blue zones. Then I'm going to look at what behaviors we might adopt to help us as those, as those in blue zones have. And third, I'm going to talk about personal genomics, like the genome sequencing I had done, and how we can use that to contribute towards having a more robust lifestyle. So you on board? Okay, let's get going. Now, we've all heard of those stories or someone on an island in the Mediterranean, or someone in Russia, they all seem to live to 100 years old. And I remember when I first heard about this decades ago, I don't remember, do you remember the Dan and Yogurt commercial? And it was uh, these Russian peasants in the field. And these Russian peasants all lived to a very long age. And, you know, they had like Sergi, Sergi with his pitchfork and his rake there, and, you know, they gave him a Dan and yogurt and they said, hey, Sergi liked it so much that, you know, he ate too. And you can even find the commercial on YouTube if you search for the Dan and yogurt, you know, Russian longevity commercial. It's out there. So, um, we're all eating yogurt these days. And yogurt's actually a $7 billion industry since that commercial aired. Uh, are we all living to 100? No. But there is a little bit of truth to it because yogurt does, is easier for people who are a little older to digest and get more nutrients and, and help them maintain their nutritional status. Okay, so let's continue on. Here we are 50 years later and we know more about the story. It's not just Russian peasants eating yogurt, okay? There are five well-studied zones and those zones are Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, and a population of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California. There are three things that contribute to the long lifespan and health span in these blue zones. First, we have genetics, uh, with genes from different sources, from our maternally inherited mitochondria, our nuclear genome, and also the important gut microbiota that we have. Second, we have lifestyles and epigenetic changes because we know that our lifestyles, you know from methylation, we've all heard about methylation turning genes on and off and how lifestyle can cause this methylation to occur. So um, we have the epigenetic changes that occur in diet. And thirdly, one thing that I think is often underemphasized uh, is a combination of a positive life attitude and social interaction. I often tell my husband, come on out, we're getting some vitamin S. Okay, uh, while not an actual vitamin, social interaction is an important part of maintaining the lifestyle that you know, contributes to longevity and health in these blue zones. Okay, let's continue on to part two. So we can actually say that genetics is an interaction between our genes and the environment. And our genetic inheritance makes up for 16 to 25 percent of our, basically, our longevity fingerprint, so to speak. So we have a lot of control over the other areas. So let's take a look at a paper that looks at how the environment, you know, how our genes and the environment interact. Okay, take a look. Here's the paper coming. Paper, paper, paper. The genetics of lo human longevity with an eco-evolutionary nature-nurture framework. 
Now, that's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> so anyhow, they mentioned seven pillars of aging. And these seven pillars are adaptation to stress, epigenetics, inflammation, macromolecular damage, metabolism, proteostasis, basically protein degradation, and stem cells and regeneration. So to demystify this a bit, epigenetics refers to the fact that we can modify our genes and turn them on and off from our lifestyles. Uh, you know that if you, you know, certain things that are just kind of genes turning on and off, not really quite epigenetics, but if you eat a lot of sugar, you know, you produce a lot of insulin. If you don't, you produce more glucagon, which, you know, dissolves fat and so on. And you know that there are genes for, say, inflammation that we can turn on by putting a methyl group on it or not. And what decides we, whether we need this methyl group or not is our lifestyle. And some of it goes back to the whole fight or flight, you know, you're about to be eaten by an animal, they think there's going to be an injury, you're going to, you know, you have a lot of stress because you, you, but your body's reacting as if you're living in a threatening, lion-filled environment, when really it's just your boss who's roaring. Okay, so let's continue on. We've all been injured, or we've had the cold or a flu, and we've had inflammation as a reaction to that injury. And chronic inflammation, where that inflammation doesn't go away, if you think of like chronic arthritis or a joint that's always kind of swollen and red and hot and so on, you know, that actually can damage the body. And they believe that the damage caused by chronic inflammation actually is one of the things that we find uh, contributing to aging and the diseases of aging. When we have proteins that have worn out because they're no longer doing their job, as when we're younger, you know, when we were younger, they you know, when they stop doing their job, your body quickly recognized them and said, okay, out the door, and broke them down, and your body, I always have said to my students, your body's a cheap date, okay? You have an old broken down protein, it's not just gonna excrete it, it's gonna break it down into the individual amino acids and turn it into something else. So as we get older, we do that a little bit less. We become less efficient in recycling, basically. And stem cells. Stem cells are cells that can become any cell in the body, and they can become brain cells, they can become blood cells. Um, we have more of them when we're young to replenish our cells uh, than as we age, and that's also linked to regeneration, and you've seen probably a lot of research these days on stem cells, treating disease and so on, uh, and also in longevity startups. <laughs> So, when we look at the genes that are related to longevity in those areas, we found a number of them. And some of those genes are apolipoprotein E, 4 box 3 interleukin-6, 6, insulin growth factor 1, chromosome 9P21, and 5Q33.3. There are papers and papers and papers on each and every one of them. Longevity inheritance is complex. We say it's polygenic. Uh, that means there's more than one gene involved. The example I've always given to my students is that your fingerprints are polygenic. You require more than one gene to get the unique pattern that makes your fingerprint unique to you. So all of these things are going to require multiple interactions of multiple genes, and therefore our longevity pattern for each of us is probably going to also be pretty unique. So, um, it's not going to be as easy as just like taking CRISPR and injecting one gene then uh, and we're all going to live to be 120. So what are some of the characteristics of these blue zone people? Okay, well let's take a look. If we take a look we'll see they're not all supermen and superwomen. At the age of 100 many of them have hearing or vision defects, low bone density, and a third of them have mildly impaired cognitive status. But they're still alive they're still healthy. They're not suffering from many of the diseases that we see at the end of life that cause a chronic deterioration of the quality of life and what we refer to as health span. But um, they still have some of the other markers that they have are they have a good balance of pro and anti-inflammatory immune markers, a strong immune system, and a healthy gut microbiota. So let's move on. I know you want to hear more about what exactly do they do and what can I do that they do. Let's take a look at this pie chart.
um, where they looked at the uh, populations of Loma Linda in the U.S., Sardinia, Italy, and that of Okinawa, Japan. What do all three of them share? Well, family, no smoking, uh, one group of three shares a plant-based diet, constant moderate activity, social engagement, and legumes. So I think these are all somewhat achievable. More, uh, more puttering, less TV time, make friends and see them, and maybe when you're by yourself, eat some beans. I think I'll also adopt the high polyphenol wine, the sunshine, and the gardening. In fact, I'm also working on a video about some of the things I plant and what I plant and how I plant them uh, that I feel have, uh, that are healthy and can contribute to good nutrition for a long and healthy life. On to part three. Okay, let's talk about personal genomics. Um, I think there's something that's going to be a game changer when we can take a look at our genome and say, okay, this is the right diet for you. This is the right drug. You want drug X, not drug Y, because drug X with your genetic is more efficient. Um, it's going to say something like, okay, you're predisposed to this disease in your family, so you want to take care and uh, have this type of lifestyle to avoid it. Now, we're not there yet, but that's where I'm hoping that we're going to go. So I love DNA tests. I've done the National Geographic one that showed the heritage of my genes where they move throughout Europe and various other places in the, in the world and so forth. Um, you know, I'm part Finnish and I'm part Italian, so I have a lot to play with. Uh, 23andMe will not only tell you your heritage, it'll match you up with other people if, you know, that you only, you don't have to, but other people that also share your genetics and tell you like whether you're a fir first cousin or a second cousin. I, I think I have 2,006 cousins, you know, um, which probably, you know, basically when you get out to that level, everybody's related. Okay. Uh, it also has, a, it tells you whether you have risks for various diseases. A lot of them with 23andMe are pretty rare. They've come out recently with like a little heart disease one and, you know, insulin or diabetes one. But it doesn't, it's not really a predictor of the disease. It's you have a gene, you have more of a chance, and it doesn't really say, it says, oh, go talk to your doctor. It doesn't really give you actionable, um, you know, actionable um, things that, you know, that you can, you can do. Okay, now while it's fun to find out your heritage um, and whether or not you have a gene that, you know, is found in one of the blue zones, we're not at the point yet where we can take one of those tests and they spit out specific recommendations and help you live longer and healthier. The Human Genome Project, though, this is really what's interesting. Things are moving faster and faster and faster these days. The Human Genome Project in 2003 was the first to sequence almost all the human genome, not all of it, almost all of it, and it cost $2.7 billion. The cost of sequencing for the entire human, human genome dropped to $1,000 in 2015. So in 2015, you could say, have your entire genome sequenced, if it was available commercially, for only $1,000. Um, 23andMe actually pairs with pharmaceuticals. You can opt in to help them uh, and allow them to use your DNA, and they make money from your DNA. Okay, they don't share. Nebula, on the other hand, is a different model. Um, I had my DNA there sequenced for $99, and I took a bunch of little quizzes, and if a pharmaceutical shows interest in my DNA, and they want to buy it or rent it anonymously, it will keep it anonymous for me, and it will also share the profits. Now, I took this a few months ago. I took the test. I haven't gotten any, you know, no one, no Amazon card yet from them saying, hey, your DNA got rented for two days or something like that. You know, I haven't gotten anything back from them. It's a promise, but not yet a reality. Uh, and the other thing, these companies are a slippery slope because uh, Nebula, when I did it, it was $99, that's it, you're in for life, okay? Uh, they're keeping it that way for me. But they've changed to a subscription model now where I think you can get your DNA sequence for about $9.99. I'll put it up on the screen but now you have to pay a month-by-month -month subscription. Uh, and unless you're in the subscription service, you can't, you know, you're not gonna be playing with the pharmaceuticals and making money possibly from your DNA. 
Um, I heard one quote that they believed in the future people's genomes might be worth over their lifetime $50,000 to them. Now, we're not there yet, and that was one person's one person's uh, view. So, um, it's interesting to, to play with these companies. We're not, you know, they can change their terms and conditions at any time. That's, that's the one thing. Nebula does give you ancestry and also, you know, again, um, a few of the different things, whether you put on muscle or whether you, you know, they, they all have like, do you detect asparagus odor in your urine and stuff like that. Things that are kind of useless. Um, I think we know if we have dandruff, we know whether we put on muscle quickly or not. Uh, some of the traits that they give you are not particularly, um, oh, wow, I never knew that. No one in my family ever, you know, uh, you know, could curl the tip of their tongue or something like that. Okay. Um, now, when, um, what they give and what I want at this point, I already mentioned, is I want something to actually give results that are actionable. Okay you know, that we will have a little chip and we'll take it to our doctor and when our doctor prescribes, he'll prescribe a drug that's most effective for us according to our genes, our race, our sex, you know, and you know, everything so it's tailored medicine. And I think that's where we are going to go with this, but we're not there yet. We're progressing very, very quickly. Um, and one of the things that came out recently, I read an article in the news and it said, it was by the Bank of America thinks we're all going to start living to be 120 and it goes on and it talks about all of the, the money that's being put into these longevity startups and companies and so on. And the other thing that it talks about is the fact that in 2015, um, in 2015 I believe, medical knowledge was doubling every seven months. And by 2020, medical knowledge will double every 20 days. Now, I find that absolutely amazing. But how long will that increased knowledge take to translate to when you actually go to the doctor or when you, you know, for your personal gain, so to speak? I don't know, but I think the development, of course, of rapid, you know, the rapidly developing artificial intelligence like we see in all the little round boxes that we have in the house that we call out to for the weather and things. I can't mention the name, otherwise I will have a chorus of my little boxes that talk to me and tell me the weather and stuff. So anyhow, um, you know, when those get a lot smarter and those start sorting through this thing a little bit better and computers get smarter and can be a little bit more independent, I think it's going to be an amazing, um, an amazing avalanche of progress. So anyhow, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this. What I have coming up next is I'm going to talk about our, one of the things closest to my heart, our pets, dogs. You know that there are dog longevity studies going on out there and there have been papers published on them and there are clinical trials going on with dogs to try to help them live longer too. It looks like longevity is not going to be a one species, uh, you know, one species uh, game. It's going to be multi-species. So anyhow, this is Judy Chalice with Lifespan and Longevity. If you like this and you want to see more, hit like, hit subscribe, and hit that little bell so you'll get notifications. And until next time, this is Judy Chalice with Lifespan and Longevity.